the rock music. We'll do that probably right after the midterm. I'll give you plenty of warning on that. So, am I recording on this? I hope. Okay, so we left off last time talking about beams, beams in bending, and we get all kinds of uh, different arrangements for beams. They could be cantilevered, uh, simply supported. Maybe I'll take a, a beam that's got simply supported section and a cantilevered section. Could have uh, concentrated loads or distributed loads on this. It could have concentrated loads. It can have uplift loads. We could even put some concentrated moments on this. All kinds of possibilities. And that uh, beam, we're going to look at uh, normal stresses in that beam, and we're going to look at shear stresses in that beam. But one of the first things we need to do is we need to uh, talk about the cross section of that beam. So if I were to uh, come into this and take a section of this, and maybe look at uh, section a dash a. It could take on a variety of shapes. I mean, it could uh, be some sort of a blob looking thing if you wanted to. We'll probably see a lot more rectangular things, but in general, let's look at something like this. And if I uh, say maybe this is the x axis and this is the y axis, and I'll look at a uh, element over here where this is some da, and talk about some y distance here and then some x distance here and we could talk about if we wanted to some uh, distance rho there we could talk about the area moment of inertia or our, our area properties which our area properties the biggest one we're going to be concerned about is the area moment of inertia which is really just a measure of how the area is distributed about some axes. Let's say that it had a cross section uh, that looked like this. <coughs> Typical arrangement for a beam. And we had a, a centroid that was there. And we could, if we uh, put that centroid, we could uh, lay this thing, not changing any of the material properties. We could lay it on its side with its uh, centroid like that. The centroid would still be on the, the axes. And the moment of inertia for this, this I value here would be much, much larger than that I value uh, there. You can imagine if you have uh, a, a situation like a diving board or something like this, you, you have this arrangement here, it's going to have a very small I, it's going to have very large deflection, very large stress values, whereas if you try and arrange it like a, a beam that you might see in the basement of a house looking up an unfinished basement or something the beams usually look uh, like this because you get a much better structural situation with that you get uh, much less deflection and much lower uh, stresses so we want to try and quantify this a little bit better and we can do this if I talk about I about the x-axis going back to this picture here I could say that I about the x-axis is equal to the integral of y squared dA or that I about the uh, y-axis is equal to the integral of x squared uh, dA and we could even if we wanted to talk about the polar moment of inertia that we've talked about just recently with uh, uh, torsional problems and that would be equal to the integral of rho a very good row there. So we'd have row squared dA. And sometimes we uh, give this the uh, symbol uh, J. And you could uh, see, of course, I mean, I, I take a bit of an aside here and a little bit of a review from torsion that uh, remember rho squared would be equal to, would be equal to by the Pythagorean theorem, x squared plus y squared x squared plus y squared. So it shouldn't surprise us that the polar moment of inertia would be equal to ix plus iy. So if we have something we may not know the polar moment of inertia, if we know ix and iy, add those together and you'll get the polar moment of inertia. But for most of our um, work, we're going to be concentrating on these right here when we're talking about bending. <coughs> 
The uh, units on these, uh, looking at the units, would be uh, something uh, length to the fourth power, because you've got a distance squared and then you have an area, so you got length to the fourth power, so probably inches to the fourth, or meters to the fourth, or maybe millimeters to the fourth, uh, or feet to the fourth, with these uh, first two probably being definitely the most common. Okay, inches to the fourth, or meters to the fourth. I remember last term when we were in dynamics, we talked a little bit about not area moments of inertia, but mass moments of inertia, describing how the mass was centered about some axes. And the, it, sometimes those are a little bit confusing because a lot of times we just talk about, oh, moment of inertia, moment of inertia. And how do you figure out which one you're talking about? Well, one you're going to look at in context. If we're talking about subjects and dynamics and things rotating, it's probably mass moment of inertia. If we're talking about beams, it's probably area moment of inertia. But the units are always a dead giveaway on that. If your units are distance to the fourth, we have an area moment of inertia. If your units are mass times distance squared, you have a mass moment of inertia. So something uh, to keep in mind as we go through this. If you want more practice on this, and we're going we're gonna to do a few problems today, but if you want more practice on this, Appendix A in your uh, textbook uh, goes through this, as well as a, a dedicated chapter in the, uh, the statics textbook from, from fall term. Well, um, let's look at these uh, rectangular cross-sections. These come up quite a bit. So maybe I'll uh, start by uh, going and, and looking at this. What is the moment of inertia for something that's rectangular? Because our beam probably is not a blob like that. What is I about an axis like that? So uh, we'll go through that next. Are there any questions before we tackle that? Well, let's do that then. So, if I say that I'm going to start out with this uh, cross section like this, we'll take a rectangular cross section, very common, and we'll say the x axis is there, the y axis is here, and I'm going to take the uh, centroid, we'll say it's homogeneous, so the centroid should be fairly easy to find, we'll take the base dimension as b, and we'll take the height, so the centroid would be located at h over 2 from either side. Okay, and if I go through this, remember we have an uh, equation. We could say that uh, if this uh, axis here is x naught, I could say that i about x naught would be equal to the integral of y squared dA. Right, so I better find a differential element here. Take a nice little trip through calculus. So I'm going to come up with that as my differential element, and I'll say that this distance is y. And then this distance here would be dy. So if I want to talk about um, this integral, I could say it was the integral from minus h over 2 to positive h over 2. Okay, I don't want to go from 0 to h, because if I went from 0 to h, I would be finding about this axis here, right? Okay. So... I'm going to go from minus h over 2 to h over 2 of y squared. And then what's dA? Well, dA is going to turn out to be what? b times dy, is that right? Is that what the uh, area of this shaded region? Should be b times dy. So if I go through this, then I could say that this was equal to uh, b, which should be a constant, y cubed divided by 3. And I'm going to evaluate this thing at uh, minus h over 2 and h over 2, which gives me what? Um, base times height cubed divided by 24. Yeah. And then let's see, it would be negative, but because I have a minus lower limit and I'm cubing it, it will turn into a positive base times height cubed over 24. So I get a final answer on this as base times height cubed divided by 
uh, 12. And that's probably worth remembering because we use a lot of rectangular cross sections and the, uh, central, the uh, moment of inertia about the centroid is base times height cubed over 12. Okay. So something there. And of course, going back to the example of taking the um, beam and orient it like this and comparing it to something like this, you can see why there's so much difference in these. Because in this case, let's say that I take a, a typical 2 by 12, which is going to be what? 1 and a half this way and 11 and a quarter that way, versus here I'm going to take 11 and a quarter and one and a half. Okay, so if I want the I in this case, my base is one and a half, and I'm going to multiply it by eleven and a quarter cubed, and I divide by twelve. In this case, I'm going to take uh, the base of eleven and a quarter and multiply that by one and a half cubed and divide by twelve. And you can see the tremendous difference between those because of which one that you're cubing. Uh, this one, I've used lots of 2 by 12s. I think this turns out to be about 178, if I remember right off the top of my head, inches to the fourth. And this one's about 3 or 4. Let me run through that real fast. Yeah, 178 inches to the fourth. And this one is uh, 3.2 inches to the fourth. So I was not kidding on this slide when I said that uh, this eye here is much, much larger than that eye there. And that's because you get to cube a, a certain distance. So when we see I come up in our calculations for stress and deflection, it makes a big, big difference. Now, there's also a parallel axis theorem. So with the parallel axis theorem, I could say that I about any axis is equal to I about the centroid plus the area times the perpendicular distance between those uh, squared. Let's see. I think I'm long on an E in axis, aren't I? Is that right? No, maybe. I guess that's okay. I'll leave that like that. So the biggest thing is this has to be through the centroid. So if, for instance, I knew the moment of inertia about this axis here, I couldn't move it up to an axis up here. One of the uh, quantities in the parallel axis theorem has to be through the, uh, the centroid. Well, let's uh, maybe use this. If I wanted to find the, parallel, the uh, moment of inertia about Ix, what would that be? So using an example here. I'd say that Ix is equal to I about the centroid plus the area times the distance squared. So what's I about the centroid? We just found that, didn't we? Base times height cubed divided by 12 plus the area of this thing. What's that? That's base times the height times the distance. If I'm shifting, this becomes the distance. What distance is that? <coughs> h over 2, isn't it? So I'm going to have h squared over 2 squared, which is uh, 4. So I come up with base times height cubed over 12 plus base times height cubed divided by 4. So this would be, what, 3 twelfths? which is, gives me a 4 twelfths, which is 1 third base times height cubed. Yeah. So We don't use that one very much. This one is much more common going through the centroid. But you get to see the uh, use of the parallel axis there. And if you wanted to do this with calculus, you, you're usually not going to, uh, if you can use the parallel axis there, you're probably not going to do the calculus, but you could try and compare it to the integral, and this time you'd integrate from 0 to h, okay, of y squared 
uh, DA, and you'd come up with the same answer. Questions with that? Well, there's a few problems where the centroid is not necessarily well known or well established. In a rectangular problem like this, uh, it's fairly easy uh, to find by inspection. But let's try a problem where we have to first find the centroid. So I'd like to uh, take um, and put a uh, 2 by 6. So we'll say that this is a, a 2 by 6. And I'm going to go with actually 2 inches by 6 inches just to keep the math easy um, rather than messing around with all the halves and quarters and whatnot. And we'll say we're going to make this built up beam out of these shapes. And uh, here we're going to have a uh, 2 by 10. And again, I need a 10. Okay, so I have a uh, 2 by 10, and I'd like to find the moment of inertia about the centroid of this. I don't necessarily know where the centroid is, but I suspect it's somewhere roughly in there. I'll have to get a better answer for that. But I'd like to find I about its centroid. Okay, So what I'm going to do is I think I'll just establish a reference down here. So I'll take this as the uh, reference. And you could take your reference anywhere that you wanted to. It's probably easier to take it at an extreme uh, one end or the other so you don't have to deal with positive and negative numbers. Um, I mean, you could, if you wanted to, put your reference here. But it, I, I think I'll just put it at the bottom. And we'll take it as, as that. So if I wanted to then uh, say that this was the uh, x direction, and maybe right out of here we would have the uh, y direction. We could talk about the uh, x centroid. Uh, let's see. Where's the x centroid on this thing going to be? Yeah, it's going to be at zero, isn't it? It's going to be centered up on that. Okay, and then the y centroid, what's that going to be? That gets uh, more difficult, doesn't it? We're going to have to do some work on that. We could go back. We learned this in statics, but it would be the sum of the individual pieces, yi times ai divided by the sum of all the individual areas, right? So if I break that up, I could say that this was equal to, based on my reference, the centroid for this 2 by 10 is going to be where? Probably somewhere about right there, which is going to be 5 inches, right? So I would have 5 times its area, which is a 2 by 10. And then I have to add that to, where's the centroid for this 2 by 6? Well, that centroid's way up there, which is going to be what? 11, because I have to go up 10 inches. 10 inches puts me right there. And then I have to go half this 2. So half of 2 is 1. So this comes from 10 plus half of 2, 2 over 2. And I'll multiply that by the area 2 times 6, 2 by 6. And then I just divide by the area, which we already have established, 2 times 10 plus 2 times 6. Okay. So you go through the math on this thing before you hit the final number. We probably, well, we definitely know that the centroid should be between these. It's going to be between this 5 and this 11. should be the average of those. So... Um, well, the area average, not the uh, mathematical average necessarily, turns out to be 7.25 inches, which uh, hopefully makes sense. That seems reasonable. So now that we have that established, that this distance is uh, 7.25 inches, I can go about finding this I about the uh, the centroid. So. What's I going to be? I could say it was the 2 by 10. So I'm going to go over and use the, uh, the notion that if I have a uh, rectangle with base B and height H, that about its uh, centroid, I is equal to the base times the height cubed divided by 12. We just established that. So for the 2 by 10, I'm going to have 2 times 10 cubed divided by 12. But that's about the uh, 2 by 10 centroid. That's about that. That's 5 inches up. So I have to shift it to the centroid. 
So if I shift it to the centroid, I'm going to have plus 2 by 10. There's the area. And I need to shift it what? The distance between 7 and a quarter and 5, right? So I have 7.25 minus 5, and I will square that distance. Okay. So this is for the 2 by 10. Maybe I'll document it this way. That's the 2 by 10. And I have to add to it. I have to add to it the portion for the 2 by 6. Well, the 2 by 6 is going to be 6 times 2 cubed divided by 12 because that's laying flat. And then I have to shift it because that's the centroid or the uh, moment of inertia about its centroid. And I need to shift that down. So I'm going to add to it 2 by 6. And then I have to multiply by what? 11 minus 7.25 squared and that's for the 2 by 6. So when you get done running through all those numbers you come up with uh, 441 inches to the fourth. Okay. 441 inches to the fourth. Well there's a couple ways and I, I won't uh, belabor these but uh, a couple other ways that you could uh, do this if you wanted to. Uh, if you started out with a large rectangle like this and then you could subtract these two pieces here that's one possibility or and you should definitely come back to the same answer this would be a good exercise to check yourself or you could break it up like this. You could take some uh, small little spots like this, and then you'd have this uh, large one like this, and this one like that. So, uh, and again, you should come up with the same answer. This one is actually kind of uh, uh, tricky because you'll you'll tend to think that this larger two by or uh, twelve, which is twelve there and six there, you'll have to remember that you have to shift the centroid of that uh, six by twelve. Because it's we're not finding about the center of the six by twelve, we're finding it about the center of this T shape. So that's something that gets past students once in a while. So that's a good exercise. But the concept of subtracting something is is really good. I don't. I, I think probably the way we did it here is the easiest way. Um, but if you had a uh, shape that looked like this, what if someone gave you a square or a rectangle and you had a circle inside it like that? So you were left with this shape here, subtracting it becomes very attractive, doesn't it? Okay, no one wants to deal with four shapes that look like this. I mean, what a mess! Take that times four. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm not interested in that. A lot better conceptually to find the moment of inertia of this thing and then subtract. Take the I for that and subtract the I for the circle, right? Yeah. Okay, so I don't know that subtracting is easier in this case, but in some cases it is uh, very good. And you've got, uh, as I mentioned, those uh, uh, notes on the uh, website. You've also got some homework problems that will run you through that. Questions with that? Well, I wanted to uh, hopefully establish that and then uh, continue on a little bit. There's one concept that comes up, and we've already talked about it uh, in past terms, but the radius of gyration so with the radius of gyration what that is conceptually and a lot of people struggle with this uh, concept but if we were to uh, have some uh, shape here and we have some axes This would have a certain i about uh, about this axis. So if this is the x-axis, let's say it would have some i about the x-axis. Okay. And what the radius of gyration does as well, it says if you take this area and you convert this area into a uh, line that goes to positive infinity and starts at negative infinity. That means this line is how thick? Zero. Okay. So a line of zero thickness that goes from minus infinity and positive infinity gives me the same area. The area of this is equal to the area of that line. 
And what the radius of gyration says is that this distance here, that's Rx. So we can say that Ix is equal to Rx squared times A. And this is the radius of gyration. Okay, which makes sense from a uh, unit standpoint. We know that the uh, units on I are going to be distance to the fourth. So if we take a distance and square it, multiply it by the area, we should get uh, distance to the fourth for our units. So if someone comes along and talks about a radius of gyration, this is what they're really talking about. So if you embrace this from a conceptual standpoint, that's fine. If, if you struggle with thinking about things like this, you're probably just fine. Because if someone gives you the radius of gyration, and they give you the area, what do you do with those? Well, you take those two pieces, you put them together, and you get I um, is equal to the radius of gyration squared times the area. Okay. So when people get into column design and things like that, uh, oftentimes they'll quantify it in terms of radius of gyration. It's just a essentially a measure of I. Questions with that? Well, as we get into uh, bending, we want to probably um, put some limits on what we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk about principle. Um, let's talk about uh, principle bending. And uh, principal values of uh, I. And a lot of times they'll talk about principal bending. They may have a different term for that. They might talk about it as symmetric bending. So, so those terms will come up. Basically, when we talk about principal values of I, these are the minimum and maximum values of I. Minimum and maximum values of I. So if we look at a uh, rectangle like this, if I look at uh, I here, this is going to be I max. Whereas if I look about I about this axis here, this will be I minimum. If you take your ruler or yardstick, there's one way that's way easier to bend it. That's because it's easier to bend about the I minimum ax or about I minimum than I maximum. Um, and, and having said that, if we take this and we uh, start to bend it, so let's say we put this shape up into a uh, beam arrangement. And put some load on it. We want to have it in this orientation, so we're we're quite comfortable dealing with shapes that look like this, or maybe even I shapes or wide flange. Most of the beams, like the beam over there in the building, is a uh, wide flange. The difference between a wide flange and an I beam is this: this would be a wide flange that I've drawn. If you have an I beam, the uh, flanges are not uh, parallel. So technically, that would be an I-beam. Uh, we could get symmetric bending out of that also. Uh, where you run into uh, problems with uh, this is if you start to look at uh, shapes like this, maybe you take some angle and you try and bend it like this. That's not going to work very well. Another one that works well is something that is a square and cross section. That's good. So we always want to be, if we're talking about principal bending, um, symmetric bending, we always want to be either working with a maximum value of I or a minimum value of I. If you start taking something like this and you have a, uh, a beam and you're going to rotate it like this on its side and start to bend it so the cross section looks like that, that's not going to work either. You don't want to do something like that. That's an advanced topic that the mechanics will 
mechanicals will go on and talk about or the civils will go on and talk about. But for our first trip through this, we want to stick with symmetric bending, to be principal bending, or the maximum and minimum values of, of I. So the, the one with the slanted edges, that's the ID, the one in the middle? This is a W shape. This is an I shape. W stands for wide flange. And usually, a uh, wide flange, uh, you might, well, why well, wide flange? Usually, this distance here is much larger than this distance here. Real common use for this is crane rails. Crane rails use an I shape because the wheels roll and align better on this than they do on the wide flange. But if you look at like the columns they built this beam with, they're they're definitely white flash. Other questions there? <laughs> What's that? No, wide flange is in W. Wide. Yeah. Sorry. Wide. Okay. Does that work? Yeah. Okay. Great. What? I it looks more long. And long. Uh, let's turn it on its side. Uh, that's like the people that were trying to find out how tall the tree was, right? And the engineer came over, cut it down, and measured it. And yeah, it's just like an engineer to find out how wide it is rather than how tall it is. So. <laughs> Well, let's talk about, uh, maybe we'll start this discussion with pure bending. So if I look at uh, pure bending, I'm going to take a, a, a beam that looks like this, and I'm going to apply a, a moment to it. Why don't I say that this is uh, m naught, and I'll apply a moment to that that's uh, m naught. And I think if I were to draw the deformed shape, it would look a little uh, like a uh, banana. Like that. And there's going to be an interface here. We could talk about the, uh, the fibers on the uh, bottom. These get longer, right? So if they get longer, we could talk about epsilon x being a positive. Okay. So if I take a, I could just take an x dimension here and uh, take this uh, then y dimension like that. So in the x, the horizontal direction that we've got here, epsilon x is positive. And if I look at the uh, fibers on the top, those are getting shorter. which would be another way of saying epsilon x is negative, right? Okay. So it stands to reason that if I go from a negative strain to a positive strain, at some point I have to have a zero strain. And what this um, is, is that this transition, we're going to call this the uh, neutral axis or the neutral surface. So we call it the neutral surface, or very soon we'll call it the um, neutral axes. I think that's correct for axes. Uh, X is horizontal. Well, that's where I transition from having negative uh, strain to positive strain. So on this neutral surface or this neutral axes, I know that the strain epsilon is equal to zero. That's what's represented with that dotted line. I think I misspelled axes here before, didn't I? Had too many E's in there. So, there we go. Either that or I misspelled it there. I like I'm okay. Okay. So that gives us our, our neutral surface or our neutral axes.
which if I start to look, if I look at a cross section of this, so let me look at that cross section. So with a, a section view, let's say it has a, a T shape like that uh, thing we were uh, tackling uh, a little while ago. Okay, and we might say that this uh, is our neutral axis. With our neutral axis, and remember that we had a uh, we were applying a moment like this. I think if you apply a moment like this, you recognize that you're probably going to have what compression here and tension on the bottom, right? Because if you uh, tension, the fibers get longer. With uh, compression, they get shorter. So if I look at the cross section of that, I say that I have compression here, and I have then tension there. So the neutral axis is also the transition not only from a negative strain to positive strain, but also from tension to compression. Okay. And this neutral axis is actually coincident with the centroid. Okay. So where the centroid is located, that's why oftentimes we're most interested in, in the centroid. That corresponds to the neutral axes when we've got something in bending and that gives us the transition from where we have compressive stresses to where we have tension stresses. And what's going to happen if I look at the uh, look at a, then a side view of this thing, so if I come over and view this from this direction over here and look at that, I might look at this beam Okay, now let's say that it's uh, simply supported at this point, and we've cut through this thing, and here is the neutral axis. The neutral axis, if we have compression up here, I could put the stresses like this, and we'll find, uh, we're not going to get into this today, but uh, we'll find when we get together next time, that these compressive stresses are arranged linear like, like that. And likewise, these tension stresses are arranged like that. And we'll find that we get our, ex uh, our largest stresses at the extreme distance. Okay, So that's going to be important because if we uh, want to start to uh, drill holes in this beam or whatnot, a, a hole here is going to probably be way less of a problem than putting a notch at the bottom of the beam. Okay, A notch at the bottom of the beam can be fairly detrimental. So where we go uh, next time, I don't want to belabor this uh, today, but we're going to uh, go on and we're going to try and come up with a value for these stresses. You can see they look like normal stresses, and indeed they will be. And we'll come up with the expression sigma is equal to minus my divided by i. Now, your, your author does not have the negative sign in there because they use a different sign convention than I do. Probably is not a big problem because before long we won't pay much attention to that. We'll uh, get in the sections that are symmetrical and we'll go through that with the section modulus. But that's uh, where we're going. We'll uh, derive this uh, equation and start to apply that to a lot of different problems. So take care till then.